Can I actually get everyone to um, put your microphones on mute and make sure that those videos are off? So we will have chances throughout um, the session for you to ask questions um, to, to the presenters. But while the session's going, if you can please have your microphone off and your video off. But while we're warming up, if I can get you to find the chat function up the top and actually enter in the chat if you're happy to do so, so where you're joining us from. And so then we can see that everything's working. So if you just enter in the chat where you're joining us from. Okay, so um, th thank you for, for adding that in. So I'd, I'd like to formally welcome you all to our primary school session for fighting the red imported fire ant or the reefer. So I'm Meg Dunford from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries in a Schools Program. Um, I'm joined today by my two colleagues, Michelle Firefield and Joe Hathaway, and we're very lucky to have Ian Turnbull from the Invasive Species Unit. So um, just before we really kick off, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge that I am hosting and recording this webinar from the lands of the Wiradjuri people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all coming from today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands of New South and waters of New South Wales. So our special guest today, we have Ian Turnbull. Um, who's the lead of the Invasive Invertebrates Program, and Pauline, um, who's a project officer for the Invasive Invertebrates. Now, Pauline and Ian are coming to us from the response today. Unfortunately, Pauline won't be live because she's um, out in the field, as is Ian, but we couldn't get um, Pauline to actually join us live today so we've got some footage that we captured with her earlier through the week to show to you but i'd like to hand over to ian um, to introduce himself and tell us where he's coming from i'm paul i'm speaking to you from uh, mawillamba where um two weeks ago on a friday afternoon we had a, a suspect and then confirmed incursion of fire ants in new south wales um, and so we've been working here for the last two weeks and we'll continue to work here um, in our efforts to eradicate them, of which we're quite confident we'll do. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass over to Megs and you can listen to my colleague Pauline and she'll, um, she'll, she loves ants. She's our ant spurt and um, she'll explain to you a lot about fire ants. Excellent. So we might um, go straight to some footage um, and Pauline's going to tell us about how to identify the fire ants, um, yeah, and what they look like and all sorts of things like that. Uh, my name is Pauline Lenanquer. I work at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry. I am an invasive ant um, specialist. So the scientific name for fire ants is Solenopsis invicta. And invicta means the unvanquished. So it means that they're really good at what they do and they're really hard to get rid of. Fire ants have two colors. The um, uh, head and the thorax are reddish brown and the abdomen or the tail is darker. It's more brown or black. So you would expect fire ants to be these really big ants with very big jaws and to be very scary, but actually it's not the case. Fire ants are very tiny. They're only two to six millimeters long. Um, so yeah, look at your ruler and you'll see that's very, very small. And the other interesting thing about fire ants is that in the colony, so if you find a fire ant nest, what you'll see is that the workers will have many different sizes. The ants won't be all two millimeters or six millimeters. There'll be a range of sizes. Some, some ants will be two millimeters, some three, some four, some five, some six, and lots of them, uh, lots of ants in between. And that's uh, an important characteristic for us to identify fire ants as well. 
So fire ants can look like some of our native ants. Sometimes it's a bit tricky to differentiate them, especially if we only see a photo. Um, so sometimes what we need to do is to take um, fire ant samples, so a little worker, and we put them under a microscope and we look at the antennas. Um, so for example, the antennas of ants, um, all ants will have a little club at the end of the antenna. It's just a, a part that's a bit bigger than the rest of the antenna. Um, and with fire ants, there's only two segments in that club. So um, it's, it's an easy way for us to identify that they're fire ants because all ants in the genus Solenopsis will have those uh, two segments. Um, another factor that we look at is that in between the, the thorax and the abdomen, the tail of the ants, they have a, a little constriction that we call a, a petiole. And for fire ants, it, it has two segments. So it's the case for lots of other ants, but that's some of the characters that we look at when we try to identify fire ants. Brilliant. And um, uh, so have you got anything to, to add to that, Ian? Uh, it's interesting when we've been talking to the community here, we actually have these, and I didn't show it last week, we have these ants in resin, and I'm not sure whether that's clear enough. Maybe yeah. I'll put something behind it. Um, and that just shows you how tiny they really are. Wow. And, and as Pauline said, there's um, a whole range of sizes, and they're all adults. So when you find a fire wow. ant nest, You'll see, like in the screen behind you, Megs, um, a whole range of sizes, and they are tiny. So, um, yeah. So many people go, "Wow, I didn't know they were so small." Everyone expects them to be a large ant, but they are very, very small. Yeah, and and is that different to other ants? No, there are there is a whole range of ant sizes. Um, so there's small black ants that are. Uh, are up at where the where the fire ants were, so it takes a little bit of effort to distinguish them and and to be really clear on whether it's a fire ant or not. Uh, we have to put them under a microscope. Oh, brilliant! Just like those images that we saw with with Pauline. Yeah, that's right. So we we can suspect and we can be fairly confident based on on their behaviour and the way they look, but to be one hundred percent accurate, we need to put them under the microscope. Excellent. Now, now, do we have any other questions? Now's the chance if you want to raise your hand, unmute your microphone, and um, if you've got any questions about how to identify the ants, because uh, we've also got sections on, you know, what happens if you get stung, biosecurity, how to report those sorts of things coming up. So something just from that last movie, if anyone's got a question, please do go ahead and ask Ian. I don't think we've got anything. Let's go to the next clip. So this clip's um, going to tell us about the habitat, how how to identify um, the mounds and the nests of the fire ants, plus um, what they eat, so their diet. There are mounds of flattish patches of soil that can be up to 40 centimetres high. Um, so they can be very small when the colony is very small and they can become very big when the colony is bigger. And in winter, they tend to build the bigger mounds, so the, the really tall one, 40 centimetres one that we see, it's because they need that mound for temperature regulation. So they're a bit like us, they get a bit cold in winter. So they build these mounds to get more sun. Um, so it can help with temperature regulation inside the nests. And so these um, fire ant mounds, what's really important is that they don't have obvious entrance holes. So native ants, they tend to have a big hole in their nests and you'll see a lot of these little mounds around where you live. And you'll be able to tell straight away, oh, that's not a fire ant nest. And so fire ants, um, they don't need those entrance holes on their mounds because they build underground tunnel. So they can build very long underground tunnel up to 10 meters away from their nest. And they can, um, yeah, just go, go in that tunnel and exit that tunnel and go and forage, look for food elsewhere away from the nest. Fire ants, they don't like to be in the bush. They don't like shaded habitat. What they like is open areas like this. This is prime real estate for fire ants. So what they like is an area that we say has been disturbed. So if um, or the earth has been moved, they will like that. They like grassy areas. They like to have water available. So they will like um, golf course, for example, or parks, or 
you score oval, they will love that there because it's it's really good for them to have the right temperature in their nests. It's very important for them so the baby ants can develop quicker. So they, they like that. It's unusual for some ants to like open areas. Like some, some ants will like open areas, but in general, all the invasive ants. So the ants that have come from another country and invaded another country, they, they like those open areas in general. They like disturbance. And one of the reasons why is that there are less ants in those areas, so less competition. Um, and so it's easier for them to establish in potentially disturbed areas. So, you know, areas that haven't been um, kept ecologically pristine. Fire ants are omnivorous, which means that they can eat pretty much any type of food. So they will predate, they will attack other insects and they will eat them, but they will also like uh, a bit of plants. They also farm scale insects and eat the honeydew out of scale insects. And sometimes depending on the type of, um, on the time of the year, and that's the case for other ants, they will have a preference for certain type of food. So for example, when we go um, as entomologists, when we go and try and attract fire ants and to check for their presence, we use jam and we use sausages and we use both at the same time because sometimes the ants will like the jam, but sometimes they'll prefer the sausages. So if we want to make sure that we'll find the ants, we give them both options. So they have both options on the menu to make sure that um, they will find the food and then we'll be able to find them. That was really interesting to learn more about, you know, what they actually need to sort of live, you know, the the requirements they have for their diet, um, also some more and more of those characteristics about their mounds and nests. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, Ian? So in terms of uh, the locations they've been found um, in New South Wales and even in Queensland, I know uh, they were found outside school in mermaid waters so school yeah it was it was three mounds or three nests just outside the gate on a, on a grassed area so up here in the Willembar they were found in a, a new subdivision or a new area that was being built for um, houses and for businesses and the only thing that's on that site at the moment is um, curb and guttering some footpaths and some trees planted along the footpath and some turf and so the person who was coming to water the plants um, the trees noticed these mounds between the concrete and the and the turf and that's that's how they were discovered so they the mounds weren't fully formed they weren't large they were quite small um, but that was enough for the person to go oh this looks a bit interesting and they went down and and discovered what they thought were fire ants and that was subsequently um, verified and that's what kicked us off here in Moolamba. Yeah, wow. It's a, that was a really great pickup, wasn't it? That they sort of noticed something unusual and um, and thought to report it. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and you were saying, so Pauline mentioned that the round, the mounds and the nest can be sort of up to 40 centimetres, but you, can, you said they can be really small as well. So really, as Pauline said, it's about keeping the queen at the right temperature so yeah. during the really cold months during the winter they'll they'll build the mound up so that they can move her higher up and in the, into the where the mound catches the sunlight and the warmth and so during during the summer where it's in places like up here where it's really quite warm today it's quite hot um, they don't need to have the queen so high up because the ground temperature is warm enough for her. So it just depends on the time of year and, and what the queen would like to have um, in terms of um, air conditioning or, or a heater. <laughs> That's that's brilliant. And they, they, they're tricky, these fire ants, aren't they? They don't make it easy for us to identify them. Yeah, 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 too easy. Now, has anyone got any questions out there in the audience? If you'd like to raise your hand for a question or you can put it into the chat box. I think we've got one in the chat box. Uh, we've got a question that's actually asking, do the bites hurt? But I do know that we've got a session with Pauline about that in just a moment, so we might hold that one over as well. What do you think, Ian? I think I've just had a look at the questions in the chat and all of those questions will be answered by Pauline, so keep your ears open. Coming up, yeah. So get those pens ready to write some answers down. Um, we might go straight to that next um, clip. 
and Pauline is going to tell us, just bear with me, she's going to tell us about biosecurity, so the importance of biosecurity, how we identify, how we report them, all those sorts of things. So fire ants originally, they come from South America and they have arrived in the US many, many years ago. And then they have been transported to Australia by accident, probably from the United States. Fire ant queens, um, most of the fire ant queens can fly. So when it's time to build a new nest, the new queens will go into what we call a mating flight or a nuptial flight. They'll be met with the males in the, in the air that will mate and then the male will die and the queen, queen will come back to the ground and start a new nest. So they can start a nest uh, as far as um, two kilometers, for example. Most of the time they stay very close to their parental nest, about 500 meters, but that's how the fire ants um, extend naturally. So in general, every year each nest will produce 500 queens but only very, very few will survive because it's, it's a very difficult world out there for new fire ant queens because the little fire ant, the queen, what she needs to do, she needs to fly um, all this time. It's, they spend a lot of energy doing that. And then she needs to find um, a place in the ground that she will like, and she needs to look after the first generation of workers herself, and she will spend a great deal of energy doing that. She won't be able to defend herself very well. So most of the time, um, out of the 500 queens, only very few will survive. We say that 0.01% um, will be able to form a nest that will then be able to reproduce. So even though the foreign queen, the foreign colonies, they send lots of queens in the air, um, only very few will survive and, and make it um, to form a big colony. Fire ants are a major threat to Australia. They are one of the world's worst invasive species because they have lots of um, different impacts on our wildlife, for example, and on other things as well. So, for example, they um, can attack animals. So they can attack dogs and cats. They can sting their eyes. Um, they can also attack cattle as well. Um, they can damage agricultural equipment, irrigation. They can sting humans and they can, um, it's not very nice to be stung and some people can have allergic reaction as well. Um, so they have a lot, lots of different impacts. That's why they're so bad for Australia. And also because our wildlife, they don't know what to do with fire ants. They don't know how to protect themselves from fire ants. Um, so that's why they're so bad uh, for here. So anything that's ground dwelling, so all your lizards, your koalas, all the cute animals that like to live on the ground, um, they can be attacked by fire ants. And that's also the case for a lot of the insects. So in areas where you have fire ants, you won't find a lot of different ants and you won't find a lot of different um, animals because they will be, um, they, they won't be able to live with the fire ants. The fire ants will push them away. Yeah, so if fire ants established all over Australia, it's been estimated that it would cost the Australian economy $1.6 billion every year in control and in impacts. Fire ants can impact agriculture, so they can do several things. Fire ants can eat the crops, some crops that they don't like uh, very much. They can also affect irrigation equipment. So if you have a very big fire ant nest next to irrigation equipment, they can damage, they can chew on the tubes and lots of different things, they don't like that. Um, the other thing that fire ants do, they attack farm animals. So if they are fire ants, um, your cows, um, especially the baby ones or horses, they will attack them. Um, especially in the eyes and muzzle. If fire ants have a nest near water, for example, they can stop the cattle from drinking water. So that happens in very heavy infestations, especially in the US where they can cause that type of issue. Well, I would recommend first telling your mom and dad. It's very important because fire ants can be dangerous. Um, and you can ask them to take a photo of the ants and call um, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry number. And the number is 1-800-680-244. Excellent. So, um, yeah, that, that was uh, some more great info. So a, a lot about, um, you know, what's actually um, the impact of these ants if they get here. I was wondering if you could tell me, I, I noticed 
uh, Pauline mentioned there, Ian, about the spread of them and that they've come, you know, originated in South America. They've come from America. Can you tell me what it's like in another country and what it could be, essentially what it could be like in Australia if they um, got a foothold? Yeah, sure. So um, if if we did nothing about the fire ants uh, here in Willembar or in, in any part of Australia, the the queens um, and the nests will get larger and larger and the colonies will get larger and larger and they would um, send out more and more queens more frequently and that would just expand so there would be hundreds of thousands of, of um, ants in a colony so then there's more queens being produced and then if they want if there's no control applied then they will start to spread so for example in America they they spread about 40 kilometers a year so wow. that's um, quite quite rapid, and uh, in China it's 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 further than that. It's eighty kilometers a year. So, oh goodness. so we're really concerned about that spread. And in in terms of the the nests that we have up here at Mwilamba, there's only a handful of those nests, and only one or two of them are actually at a point where there has been that flight that um, that Pauline talked about. The mating flight and so we suspect that there could be another fire ant nest within a five kilometer radius of, of this site up here so what we've done is drawn a big circle on a map and said um, anything in this area that potentially could harbor a fire ant queen who has landed on on the material um, needs to be checked um, before it goes back out into the rest of New South Wales because we don't want to, to spread it. So um, so we've we've identified locations such as landscaping businesses that have mulch and soil, those those locations that a fire ant queen when she's flying along says to herself, mm, that looks like a good spot for me to go and start a new colony. So we've identified all of those locations, um, especially within the close proximity, especially within two kilometres of the, the nest, and they've all been inspected. So we've had scent detection dogs, so a sniffer dog like you find at the airport, go along and go to all of those sites and see if they can find fire ants. So the spread is, is um, you know, there's a lot of ability for them to spread very far, but if we can get to them as soon as possible or as early as possible, then we've got a much better chance of eradicating them. It sounds like for, for the first detection to have been sort of in New South Wales only, what, two weekends ago. My goodness, it sounds like you've done a lot of work. Yes, we've been busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like amazing work that you're doing, um, sort of identifying, you know, one one small nest in all that area. It, you, it would be very tough work. Have you got a lot of people helping you to do it, Ian? Yeah, so we, um, we have... Uh, the National Fire Ant Eradication Program. So that's a team, a very large team of people who are working on eradicating fire ants from the, the, um, the zone in Queensland. And because New South Wales um, contributes to that national program, um, on the Friday afternoon, once it was confirmed as um, fire ants, we had the program staff on the ground um, on Saturday morning, walking around, looking for more nests, um, we had the detector dogs coming on the Monday morning looking for, for sign of ants. So we had a very quick response and we will continue to do that work um, until we're satisfied that we don't have any more ants. And then we'll also continue to treat them, um, which we'll talk about in, in a minute. Excellent. Now, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Now's the chance for you to raise your hand to ask a question. If not, we can hold them to the end. No, I'm not seeing too much. So we might go to the next session, uh, the next clip, which um, Pauline's going to tell us about. Um, so this is for those questions that were earlier in the chat, if you hold them to now. What happens if you get stung? Let's watch about that. But when fire ants are disturbed, especially at the nest, at the nest they won't be very happy at all. They will swarm out of the nest and they will communicate with their other workers' friends. Um, they will send what we call an alarm pheromone and tell all of the workers to come out of the nest and attack whatever is disturbing them. And the way they will attack is that 
because they will bite you, but you won't feel the bite because they don't have very big pincers. But what you will feel is the sting that comes afterwards. So they bite you to get an anchor point on your skin and then they will sting you. And when they sting, they inject a venom um, and that venom is what hurts when fire and sting. It, in my opinion, I've been stung by fire ants. It doesn't hurt really bad. It feels like a, a slight burn. But when you get stung many times, which is likely to happen if you disturb a fire ant nest, that, that can hurt quite a bit and it's not very nice. So fire ants are dangerous to humans because their venom is very similar to bee venom. Um, so some people um, that are allergic to bees, they're also allergic to fire ants. So a very small proportion of people are allergic to them. So when they get stung, they can have an allergic reaction, um, which um, can be pretty bad for a very small percentage of people. The other reason is that when fire and sting, um, there is um, the sting develops into sometimes a pustule, well, most of the time to a white pustule, and that can become quite itchy after a few days. And if you don't keep that area clean, you can get what we call a secondary infection. So just like if you have a mozy bite and you scratch it many times, you can infect, uh, you can get an infection. It's the same for fire ants. So if you get stung by fire ants, you should contact the Department of Primary Industry to tell us um, that you think you've been stung by fire ants. But also before you do that, um, you need to get some first aid. So basically what you need to do is apply a cold compress to the area to reduce potentially the itching and the swelling. Um, the other thing you can do is to wash the area with soap because you Um, I would say talk to an adult um, and maybe that will give you what we call antihistamines to help with the allergic reaction. That's really interesting. So that, so if we do potentially get stung, which hopefully we're not going to because um, your team in is doing such a good job, keep, you know, eradicating these um, so, so these fire ants in New South Wales. It's really good to know that we're not going to die. Ian, you're on mute too. Apologies. Hey, yeah, sorry, got you again. That's okay. Yeah, look, and um, as part of our pre preparation for fire ants coming into New South Wales, we created a fact sheet which we we distributed to every ambulance driver and every emergency department um, and a lot of doctor surgeries and chemists throughout New South Wales. So if someone comes to them and, and says, you know, I've got all these ant I've got all these bites or stings um, and it looks like this, then those medical professionals can then say, hmm, that I suspect that might have been fire ants what, and, and have that conversation and then they can call us um, and we can investigate that. So um, while we don't think it's a, going to be a common occurrence, it's definitely something that we have prepared for. Oh, that's unreal. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've done all the planning there. Everyone knows about it, haven't they? Don't they? Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Well, has, now, does anyone have any questions? So there were those couple of questions. What does it feel like? Obviously, it's a burning sensation. Um, people with allergic reactions might have an anaphylactic um, response. But um, other, other than that, it's, you know, cold compress, rinse with water, and hopefully after a bit of time, definitely tell mum and dad and then report to the DPI if you think it was a fire ant bite. Any other questions there? We might go to our next session then. So the next content, um, Pauline's going to be telling us about some of the detection signs that's that's happening out there in the field. When we find fire ants, we do lots of tests on them to understand where they come from. So what we do is we take a lot of the workers away with us, we put them in a little tube and we send that back to the lab. And what the lab is going to do is several genetic tests. Um, so what they'll do is they'll try, they're using the a genetic technique, um, state-of-the-art genetic technique, they'll check where the ants have come from. So if they've come uh, from Queensland, where they have fire ants currently, or if they come from overseas as well, so they can do that with genetics. Um, the other thing they'll do is they'll determine whether the fire ants, they'll determine whether the fire ant colonies have one or several queens. And that's very important to understand how the infestation spread. So when the fire ants have one queen per colony, um, that's when they send queens flying in the air. 
and that's how they spread and they can spread quite far those new foreign queens when the colonies have several queens per colony um what happened is that they spread a little bit differently so the way in which they spread is that a foreign queen from that colony at some point she'll decide you know what i've had enough i'm just gonna walk away and what she'll do she'll walk away she'll take a few workers with her and she'll establish a new nest nearby so that's how they spread and they only establish a nest a few meters away so these colonies will be a bit bigger because they have lots of queens um, having eggs but they will also won't spread as fast the other thing we're doing with the genetics is that when we have fire and colonies on site, um, we'll test whether they're related. So we'll test whether one of the colony um, is the mother of another colony, basically, to try and understand what's their relationship, how they got here, um, and that's all very important for us. And so when we find the nest, the first thing that we, that we do is we kill the nest itself. So we dig up the nest and we use an insecticide to kill the fire ants. Uh, and it's an insecticide that's used for many other insects like termites. It's not a super potent special fire ant insecticide, but it needs to be used at a certain dose for fire ants. The other thing that we do is we treat um, outside of the nest uh, up to two kilometers. Um, and we use what we call a Nigea bait. That's insect growth regulator bait. And what the bait does, it's um, a um, so we spread the bait and the fire ant workers will come, take the bait and bring it back to the queen and the queen will feed on the bait. And what the bait does, it sterilizes the queen. It works like a contraception for the queen, which is really cool. And what it does, it stops the queen from laying eggs. So she won't be able to lay eggs, um, which means she won't have larvae, she won't have pupae and she won't have workers. And so the colony will become smaller and smaller and smaller because all the workers will die of old age and the queen will be left alone. And when she's left alone, there's no one to feed her and she can't survive. The queen's a bit lazy, she needs workers to feed her. You shouldn't treat a nest yourself for several reasons. One of the first reasons is that it's difficult to treat a fire ant nest. You need um, specialist uh, insecticides and you need specialist treatment to treat the nest. So you need specialists to look at the nest and decide what's the best way to treat it and kill the nest. The other reason is that when we find a fire ant nest, the scientists, they come and assess the nest. They need to check several things. And one of the things that they need to do is to take samples from the nest, to take workers back at the lab and do all the tests that I've talked about. So they need to check whether we have one queen per colony or several queens to determine whether the, the, there are new queens that could have flown very far or not. Uh, we need to determine where the nest has come from, uh, potentially, you know, is it Queensland, is it overseas? We need to look at all these things. And we can't do it if someone kills the nest or if it's very reduced. We, we really need to be able to do that. The other thing that um, we need to do, we, we need to know that we have fire at nests also, because what we'll do is we will stop the fire at nest from expanding further. So, for example, if you find a nest in your yard, will tell you, well, don't move any dirt around, uh, don't take it to your neighbor, because it may contain a queen, and that means that the fire ant will expand, will expand because of that. So that's the reason why um, don't treat a fire nest yourself. And I'll, yep, you've already got that. Yep, unmuted there, Ian. That, that was brilliant. So, um, yeah, so is there anything you wanted to add about all that detection science? How is that actually working out in the field? Yeah, look, there's a number of things that relate to what Pauline said that have occurred here in Willembar. So we've done the genetics on the on the ants that we have found here. Uh, they are they are all um, single queen nests. So then we we assume that and they are all old enough to have that nuptial flight. So we do assume that they've flown up to five kilometres uh, in that zone. So um, the other thing that we found out from the genetics is that they have quite different genes and that they have definitely come from Queensland. So we know because they've got different genes in that one, those couple of nests up there, that they haven't come from a mother nest somewhere here in Mwilimba. Otherwise, they would all have the same genes. So we're confident that uh, this is a uh, an incursion that has started from the transport of material from Queensland, and that's where it's kicked off. So that's where the why you know getting those samples and getting that genetics done 
is really, really important to us. The other thing I wanted to touch on is that um, because there is a potential that we have had fire ants somewhere in that five kilometre zone, we are now going to treat the five kilometre zone and that's a very large area. So um, the treatment will, in will include people walking with the handheld fertiliser spreaders or seed spreaders that you might have seen. Uh, we'll probably use drones in some locations and because uh, up here at Mullumba there's a lot of farmland, a lot of cane, we'll use a helicopter to spread that bait over the five kilometre radius of this incursion. Wow, it's it, you really are doing an amazing job taking it very seriously. We don't want it in New South Wales, do we? No, not at all. And look, and in terms of that treatment, we'll have to do three treatments and then another three treatments next year. So we are... We, um, so in you know, for the long haul. Yes. Yeah. So eradic eradication is not a quick process. It is a long process, but we, we want to be certain that we don't have um, fire ants. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, that's unreal. And and I think I was just uh, you mentioned something there about the transport of material. So how do you think that they how can they be transported in material? What type of material? What does that mean? Yeah, so um, from long experience, we know that the fire ants in Queensland, um, they have nests. So they like we've talked about turf. So turf farms, uh, that's a one spreader. Uh, we know they like soil so we know the pot plants um, and then just any soil uh, any organic soil uh, we know that they like mulch so that's warm and and cozy so mulch products sand there's a number of products that we know that the firing queens like and that they will, they will use and some of those that's how we've had um, the movement of fire ants within queensland but also now into new south wales yeah, wow. So no buying um, turf, pot plants, um, bags of soil from Queensland and bring it back to New South Wales, isn't that right? Well, you can. <laughs> you can legally. Um, you just need to make sure if it comes from the known fire ant zone that it comes with a certificate that says that these particular products have been treated to ensure that fire ants don't come with that product. So you can still bring it across, but it needs yeah. to be treated. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's that's really good. Um, now, we're sort of getting to the pointy end of this, so I'll get um, schools, if you've got questions, please do put them in the chat. But there's one question here from um, Panania Primary School that I think it really has been answered, but I'd love you to just sort of put it all together. So what can we do to help? If you could just give us some really key reminders of how can students help these holidays, especially going into the Christmas period? Yeah, look, it's it's reasonably straightforward. If you're on holidays anywhere in New South Wales and you see something that looks like a nest or, or um, you know, a bit of dirt piled up somewhere, then have a look at it. Um, see if it's got that entrance hole that that Pauline talked about all of our Australian native ants, they come up through the front door, which is at the top of the mound. Um, whereas these South American ants like to come up in the lawn around. So just check for that entrance hole. Um, and if you see ants uh, in around that um, mound, and if they're all that range of sizes that I showed you um, within, the, within the resin, yes, that's it. Um, then I would be I would be asking mum or dad to come and take a photo and and just have a look. Um, well, yeah, and report that through to 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 us here at New South Wales DPI. Um, we'd much rather look at photos of native ant, so don't be afraid to be wrong. We would much prefer you report it and be wrong than not report it and fire ants um, established anywhere else in New South Wales. Yeah, yeah, that's thank you very much, Ben. That's that's so important to remember. I know I'll have my eyes peeled these holidays. Be looking around. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm just looking for questions. There doesn't seem to really be really much, so I might just share my screen and show um, show you all where you can find some extra resources if you want to learn a little bit more in your classrooms for the rest um, for the next over the next couple of days till the end of the year. Um, and also more importantly where to you know find our live maps and where to report. So just bear with me here. There we go. I hope everyone can see that. 
Perfect. So the school resources and DPI resources. So um, in from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry Schools program, we've got a range of different activities you could be doing in your schools or even at home in the holidays. Um, We've got some great um, activity guides. We've also got some great little interactive identifying invasive ants and native ants, little little games you can play. There's also the on the right there, the take your students outside this summer. Um, it's a guided activity of how to do some surveillance at your school or in your community. Um, obviously, as well, more importantly, on the um, in the New South Wales DPI website, we've got a section on red imported fire ants. So if you put in the search bar up the top, red imported fire ants, you will see a live map there showing um, any any progress and and you know any movement of the fire red imported fire ant incursion. Um, the red part there is uh, New South Wales is Mwilumba, and across the border is you can see how close to what's happening in there in Queensland. So find all of this and much, much more at the New South Wales DPI website, which is www.dpi.nsw.gov.au. The school resources are at the end, education training. Um, tap the drop down and you'll find our resources there or use the search bar to um, see all the resources and how to report on the website and send in photos of any um, unusual things you see. Now, just to leave you with a, just if you didn't take anything from this session, I really want you to remember this is for anything suspicious, um, please do call, just like Ian said, just, just call us if you see something that you think is quite unusual, 1800 680 244 for any suspicious sightings or go to the website to send your photos. Thank you everyone very much for joining us today. We hope you have a lovely summer holiday and Christmas and we hope um, due to the work of Ian and his team that you do not see any um, red imported fire ants. But thank you for joining us to learn more about it.